I wanted to first start off by asking you, what was it that inspired you to make this documentary, and what, what was the ultimate goal that you were hoping to achieve with it? Let, let me do the obligatory. Thank you all for being here, and oh. thanks to the O oh, Cinema for Please, thank putting you. this on. Uh, the Southern Circuit, which is sponsoring, sending documentaries around the various states. Yeah. Um, so the question is, what started this? How did this yes. all come about? Yeah. Um, I uh, obviously am not Native American. Uh, that's a legitimate issue that people bring up occasionally about making this film. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that if you'd like. But the way it all came about was I moved from Washington, D.C., where I was working as a journalist to Wyoming a long time ago, um, on, the, on the assumption that there was just a lot more in the way of good stories unwritten out there than there were back in D.C., where there were a lot of journalists chasing every little thing. Um, thought I'd go for a few years working at an environmental publication called High Country News and then just stayed. Raised a family there. Um, my wife uh, is an attorney and she actually went to work and at one point had an Indian law practice. But I covered the Winter to Reservation as a reporter and I always made sure people understood because they get all kinds of non-Indians kind of parachuting in to be an anthropologist study or, or write a story for a newspaper and then leaving and never coming back again. Um, I was there for years and, and continued to be there even after I moved to working for magazines and doing book work. Um, became friends with a number of families um, that we knew well enough to see um, socially and stuff. And at some point, uh, as I recall, the Soldier Wolf family, you've seen Yufna and Mark, Mark the Elder, Yufna the daughter, um, invited me to come down with them to the, the Salt Lake City Olympics where they were going to dance in the closing ceremony. And I brought along a, a camera, a friend from Wyoming PBS where I was working then. And we all just kind of had a rollicking good time down in Salt Lake, sort of laughing at the whole scene. Um, and we really were friends thereafter. And Yufna, a few years ago, as you know, this is all five or six years ago that all this happened. Um, we just saw each other on some occasion and she said, you know, I, I'm really fighting hard to get the remains of these children back that my father and my grandfather tried. And the U.S. Army's always rebuffed us, but I'm going to really, I'm going to make it happen. And you ought to pay attention to this. I said, well, okay. And I thought I'd maybe write an article about it because it would be the usual banging heads with the government and you don't get anywhere. Well, I think a month after she first mentioned it to me, she called back and said, I think they're going to let us come. And I thought, this is now a, a real story with a, with a visual component, this journey to find these children and bring them back. And I asked her, you know, could we come along with cameras? And she did, as she would always do, uh, deferred to um, other authorities within the tribe. And the tribe has a kind of a formal structure under a business council, as a lot of tribes do. And we go to the business council, I did, and asked permission to film, and they said fine. But that's much less important than going to the invisible tribal hierarchy. And that, in the case of the Arapaho, is what they call the four old men. And so two of them are in the film. Um, it's not generally always known outside the tribe who they are, but um, we knew who they were, and I went and spoke with them, three of them, and uh, they gave us permission to come. And, and ultimately, Crawford White, who you saw in there, um, who had been an old friend of mine, but um, he told me this is just something we don't do. We don't share this kind of thing, but we've talked and talked about it. We think it's a story that really needs to be told. They wanted the story told. Mm -hmm. and, and on that basis, they were willing to let us even bring cameras into the ceremonial tent, mm -hmm. film things that normally you wouldn't, you wouldn't film. We did honor anything, like they said, don't film the actual bones as they come out, and we did not. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that, we respected whatever they, they asked for. But you know, they let us come to the funeral, they let us do a lot of things that uh, were surprising. Well, talk a little bit about that conversation that you had with them, because I think, I mean, I, I find it fascinating, the concept, because I mean, you know, I'm sure you touched on it right in the beginning of, your, of what you said there, that there must have been some sort of challenges, ethical concerns, um, you know, there's there's trust factors that come into play, um, and so I'm curious, what were those conversations like? Can you can you give us a little more detail about that? Like, how did you meet them? Where was it? And all that. Well, they, they were so you have to mark. I just go to their place. They, they live out there, St. Stephen's uh, Mission, and I've been there often before. And, and so we would just meet with the whole family actually, 
and talk to them. Crawford I also knew personally, so he and I met. Nelson and his wife, um, I did not ever go to their home to talk to them. But again, with the elders, it was just, it's individual conversations. I don't go to a, there's no formal meeting or structure, um, but they, they will certainly let me know and do uh, what can happen. Actually, the bigger challenge was the youth. They, quite rightly, uh, Juwan Willow, a great young man, um, was just like, I don't know why you're doing this. And, and he, he pretty much never stopped saying that. Um, I love the guy, and he, but he, he it's absolutely right. The, the, the interesting thing is, there are Native American talents out there who are developing and who could do this. Now, one of them worked with me, Jordan Dresser, was another real collaborator on this documentary. And I'm, I'm sort of proud and a little patting myself on the back to say that our newest documentary, which just came out this fall, which is about missing and murdered indigenous women, Jordan is the producer. I'm just the executive producer in the background. And that's the right evolution, I think. You know, he was ready to, he could tell these stories himself. And so it's a legitimate question that the kids would ask because mm. kids are literate with this stuff. They're, it's their language working in film and stuff. Me, I'm, I'm a writer who just kind of shifted sideways into it. Um, but the other thing, of course, is unlike writing books, making films cost money, quite a yeah. lot of money. Mm -hmm. And um, because I had been working for PBS, I'd done a couple of other national documentaries as well, I could get money. Um, wasn't too easy. We got it kind of at the halfway point, we suddenly got the money, but um, that's an advantage that I have, and really that a lot of non-Indians have over some very talented native filmmakers. Sure, sure. So in terms of the research for the film uh, and conducting it, how were some of the challenges, or what were some of the challenges that you faced uh, in uncovering the history of the school, and, um, and, and how did that process work itself? Sure. Well, there's a, so there's a U.S. Army uh, War College, uh, ironically, uh, where the Carlisle uh, School used to be now. And it also has an education wing with a lot of archival materials and, and research materials. I also went to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. I had a researcher work with me down there who was more familiar with the collections than I was. Uh, checked the Library of Congress, we didn't find anything there. My biggest help was Dickinson College. Um, they have developed uh, an archive, a Carlisle Indian School archive, and, and they have a graduate student course every year where they go down and work in those collections <coughs> of the archives. And so they have gradually brought a lot of that material back. There was a photographer locally in Carlisle, who had a studio there, that was befriended by Richard Henry Pratt, the founder of the school, and he did the photos you saw, kids arriving, kids after they were transformed. Um, I found I came back again and again to that picture of the Wind River kids when they arrived. You, you go, I mean, I can barely talk about it. You come in on those faces. They're the bravest little kids you can imagine. What they've just gone through, they've, they've traveled across a continent they'd never gone very far on before. Uh, and there they were, not knowing what they were facing, just standing up to that camera. But in, during your research, did you feel like maybe there was anything that was being discovered or something new uh, in the, the hidden part of that history that, that you stumbled upon that, that really hadn't been touched on? Uh, there were a lot of numbers that were not, that we put together, we pulled together, mm -hmm. again with the help particularly of the Dickinson College archivists and others. Um, there are things people don't, really, I mean, this is left out of the history books. That's one of the reasons it was an important story and one we wanted to do. Um, so you don't have that kind of overarching, here's what the boarding schools are all about. We had to kind of dig that up and put it together. Mm -hmm. There are now a number of books out that cover some of this, and a couple were out before that, but there was additional information. How many kids went to Carlisle? It wasn't even clear um, how many actually died. It's a lot more than what was in the cemetery, and I'll explain that in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, Lots of things like that. What did they really die of? Uh, Frank Natale, that was his research subject as a, as a graduate student, so he was very helpful with that. So there was a lot of research underway that we piggybacked on and a certain amount that we did ourselves. One of the things we learned was that, um, first of all, you might remember that in the mistaken grave swap, when they dug up that grave, the wrong grave, there were actually two boys buried there. So it's, when we say there were 200 X number of kids in the cemetery, no one actually knows. There probably are more. 
Um, as you may know, if you followed the stories out of Canada, uh, at the residential schools there, there are a lot of unmarked cemeteries. Uh, I've walked around Wind River with Lynn St. Clair, who you saw the film, and she said, under that tree over there behind the Washakie School, that's where the federal boarding school burials were. So it was happening. The other thing they did at, at Carlisle is they were dependent on federal funding. They needed their kind of their numbers to look good. So a lot of times when kids got sick with tuberculosis, whatever it might be, they sent them home. And they would then die, you know, not even, maybe even on the way, but at least after they got back to the reservation. Uh, you mentioned Richard Pratt, and I, what I find to be kind of a, um, a compelling aspect of the story is that he believed what he was doing was best for Native American students and uh, that were under his care. How did you approach that question of intent versus impact, and, and what do you think viewers should take away from that? I approached it by having a lot of arguments with Jordan Dresser. <laughs> uh, Jordan was yeah. my Northern Rappo collaborator. He said, don't give him, don't give him credit. You know, he just, he really thought um, he didn't deserve it. But I'd, I'd read his autobiography, um, looked at his history pretty closely. Uh, there was a movement in the late 19th century, right after the Indian Wars, and the reservations were being taken shape and they were, they were not good places because the supplies never came. Uh, a lot of the tribes were sort of war damaged and, and in bad shape. Uh, and there was a movement. Uh, Helen Hunt Jackson was the, the former who kind of led it to you know, save Indians from reservations. So Pratt kind of fell right into that, and he really did believe that this was the only chance for survival. The numbers of Native Americans in the country, on the continent, had dropped from the millions to at that time, at the end of the Indian Wars, about a quarter million total. That was just phenomenal loss of, of life. And uh, so they took these children, and the, and the numbers were extraordinary that they took. They took 80% of the Native American kids alive and living on reservations were pulled into boarding schools during that period in the 1890s around then. So it was quite, I mean, it, it, it was a really big thing. It wasn't just an isolated little story. And, and that's why, you know, frankly, it, it really belongs in the history books. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm gonna open this up for anybody who has any questions. Um, but I, I was also curious, and I think I might even know the answer to this question in hearing your response, but if you could have gone and interviewed any figure from the history of the school, uh, you know, who would it have been and what question would you have asked them? It would have been a lot of questions. Pratt, I would have loved to have yeah. interviewed, obviously, but another one that uh, is not mentioned in here, although I think we quoted him once, is a guy named Luther Standing Bear, who was a student at Carlisle, and, and one of the success stories, in the sense at least that he went on, excuse me, to actually get higher education, mm -hmm. and then became a very, good writer, speaker, um, kind of a well-known figure. He was Lakota, um, so I would love to talk to him and dug a little deeper under the things he wrote. Um, but it would have been mainly to ask him, you know, what was the real experience? One of the things you may have noticed wasn't in here, and I, I tend to go on when I get started on this. Oh, no, please. Um, we've all heard about um, abuse at boarding schools, physical abuse, sexual abuse, lots of different things happen. Um, we look for that with Carlisle, and in fact, um, Elizabeth de Gagne, the, the forensic anthropologist who was doing the work on the bones when they were retrieved, uh, had been ordered not to look for physical harm. That kind, that was not, she wanted, to, she wanted to do DNA testing, which was at the request of the tribe, and she was not to look for, I'm not, I'm not sure what to call it, but signs of abuse, which would have been at the request of the army. Um, but we got to know each other, and she, I did talk to her about it, and in fact, she didn't find on these three remains, any, you know, the, the sign of a broken bone healed or that sort of thing, but just didn't find it. Carlisle, I think, was um, exemplary in that sense that he ran a tight ship, and I don't doubt that kids were, I know they were physically disciplined, but real abuse, uh, not real abuse, but abuse of the kind that we've heard of, the really horrific stuff, does not appear, from what we know so far, to have happened there. Was there anybody that you wanted to interview that denied the request or wouldn't talk with you? Um, we didn't get the Army spokesperson we wanted to. Okay. Conrad Crane was, was fine um, and probably the appropriate person, but uh, I wanted to kind of tell the story of, of what a struggle it was to get in there, both for the, for the tribes 
And for us, uh, we, they fought like crazy to keep us out with the cameras. In fact, we had to sneak in on the bus a couple of times. Um, so I wanted to get an official there because I wanted to bring in the fact that it's now the War College. And I wanted to also, you know, dig a little into why did they resist for like decades and then finally let them in, but couldn't get anybody to do that. No. So, right. All right, so questions, yeah, go ahead. Thank you for making this film. My name is Adele and I'm a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe of South Dakota, which is where my mom grew up. She went to Lakota. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a great place. And all seven of my mom's siblings and my mom attended Stefan, which is one of the Catholic Indian mission schools. Um, and I talked to one of my aunts today and I never knew, but actually her mother, she's from the Mandanadots at Arikara Tribe, North Dakota, um, walked out of Carlisle because it was so horrific in 1938. She literally fled on foot and made it from Pennsylvania back home to North Dakota. So I would be interested in more exploration of that because I'm quite certain that it wasn't a good fit for most of the people who were brave enough to survive it. But my question is, again, we really appreciate you making this. Have you considered doing an exploration of the Catholic Indian Mission Schools? Because those stories are not told and I have them from my family. Everyone has passed on now but I'm making an effort in our family to make sure that those stories are documented, like why my grandmother felt she had to send them there. And the answer was that the racism was so extreme, right in the public schools of South Dakota, she felt her kids wouldn't have had a shot, but she was raised, you know, she was sending them off to be raised by very sadistic Swiss German nuns who had the same mentality of kill the Indian, save the man. I did have to ask, do you know Fred McRae by any chance? Of course. Okay, I, I did some work with him at one point. Very cool. Um, Let's see, well, um, first of all, there were a lot of runaways. Uh, they didn't usually get very far, but some of them did. And one of our, um, I think it was Mark Soldierwolf, had a lost sister. Who, you know, it would have been his parent, his, his dad, um, who had run away from, uh, I, I think it was from Carlisle, and had never been brought back, and, and ended out in Minnesota. So they, she was really lost, lost to her family, lost to her tribe. Um, had a life, as it turned out, but again, wasn't reunited for the longest time. Um, so that's a, that's a, a very real thing. And again, I, I watched this thing, and all I can think of is the things we didn't do that we couldn't include because we, once it got picked up by independent lens, we had to squeeze it into an hour. Lots of stories um, left out. But um, the other question, I, I, there's a, there's a huge story there. I. I tend to be a microcosm, macrocosm filmmaker. I want a, I want a really specific story with real people in it. That's where I want to focus. But I love it when it has something bigger around it. And boy, if you found the right story to tell about the, the Jesuit or other denominations, boarding schools, um, there's just a lot there. It's, it's a powerful thing. And, and in some cases, pretty horrific. Um, Taylor Sheridan's new, one of his, I don't know if you know Taylor Sheridan. Is yeah. that the one? I couldn't remember which of the three yeah. it was. It has a sequence about boarding schools, which I'm not sure how well Taylor really gets to the, gets his research done, but it definitely portrays a horrific uh, case of nuns being abusive and nobody helping those kids. The mission statement, um, uh, kill the Indian, save the man, did that, did that come from the government when they founded the, the school of Carlisle, or did that come from the... the, the it, it was Richard Henry Pratt, the founder. Was, that was his, basically, mission statement for the school? It was, I, I don't, it never was put in a mission statement. He, he, he became a speaker, and all the, like, 25 plus boarding schools that followed off reservation were modeled after his. Uh, the, pra the full phrase was, kill the Indian in him and save the man, and it was, I found it in a speech that he gave to, I'm trying to remember if it was a historical society, because he, so he got booted out of Carlisle before it closed in 1918. He was just always kind of at war with the federal government over funding and issues like that. Mm -hmm. But he kind of went around, he never stopped proselytizing, never stopped campaigning for what he believed. Mm -hmm. and, and he would say that whenever he gave a speech. It, and it became very popular, if that's the right word, it was used. Uh, in other, other by other people as well, as an expression of what we're trying to do. Um, there, there's a general from the a Civil War general who, at some point when the when Congress was debating, 
whether to fund boarding schools, came up with the number that it costs $1 million to kill a Native American in the Indian Wars, because it was hard. I mean, they, they fought and ran, and it was, it was quite the deal. One million per Native American killed, whereas send them to school and you can do six years with them for twelve thousand dollars. So, you know, some of it was high-minded and some of it was way down here. It's awful. Uh, yes. Yes. Would the Native American children of the Southeast not send to boarding schools? Say it again. I'm sorry. The Native American children of the Southeast. Um. So, I didn't yeah, see yeah. on the map there were any... Well, that was a terrible map, by the way. I, that's, that's one of the things I look at and say, oh, he didn't do what I asked, because I wanted to show... I mean, there were like over 100 tribes that sent children to Carlisle. Um, they were... The, these are tribes, most of whom had been moved to Oklahoma at that point. And so, I, I don't know if that's what you're thinking, like Cherokee and some others. They were all represented at Carlisle. Um, the Os Osage tribe was one of the tribes that was moved to Oklahoma and there was very successful in really in land transactions. They, they got some land that had oil under it and they provided money that under sort of uh, provided foundational money for Carlisle, I believe thinking that it was going to be for their tribe specifically to get schooling. So there were a lot of Native American leaders who felt like we got to learn how to deal with these guys. We need to send some of our children to a place like Carlisle so they'll learn all that stuff and come and bring it back to us. Anyway, that's not a full answer to your question. I can tell you that a great many of those southeastern tribes that had been moved during the Andrew Jackson years to what they called Indian country were in fact at Carlisle. Um, I don't know if Seminoles or uh, you know, remnants of tribes that remained here in the south um, were together enough and organized enough, like maybe the Eastern Cherokee, to have sent children to, to Carlisle. I actually don't know that. But when they say, I think the number's up as high as 140, and that includes a lot of Alaskan groups, which are, which are many numbered, but still, that's a lot of tribes represented. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, can you talk about the impact of Carlisle on the Arapaho? I think your last statement was just about how they sent the children to learn and bring things back to the community. And I want to just better understand like what their sentiment is if they were able to, you know, uh, assimilate better or, you know, develop better, survive better, like what their feelings are, you know, especially with the, the bodies coming. I mean, this is one I wish, and, and I'm sure you do too, that Jordan was here with me or someone from the tribe who could speak to that better than I could. Um, you know, we're generations away from Carlisle now, but a lot of people, um, like Millie Friday, went to subsequently to boarding schools, which, which became quite a different thing. They're still very underfunded, but they're, they're much more representative and much more willing to teach about tribal issues and matters now. Anyway, um, so a lot of, the, even the folks we saw in the film had gone to boarding schools. Betty Friday went to a boarding school. Uh, Hugh Friday went to a boarding school. Crawford went to St. Stephen's, the Catholic mission on the reservation, and so did Nelson. Um, did they I think they do benefit from it in the sense that they have the same tools we all get from getting some arithmetic and reading skills and things like that. And, and the English language skills that are useful because they're government, they have government, government relationships with the state and with the federal government, and they gotta have people who can talk. Um, my wife's an attorney who's done a lot of work for the Arapaho tribe, and you know one of the things that we watched happen, and, and she encouraged in her career, was the gradual replacement of non-Indian attorneys like her with tribal attorneys. Not necessarily Arapaho attorneys. I think the current Northern Arapaho attorney is from can't remember what tribe, but she's not from, she's not Northern Rapid, but she's, but she's native. And that's, that's just a process that's going on. I, that didn't totally answer your question. I think you'd get a very mixed answer. You know, a lot of them, their grandparents wouldn't even talk about the boarding school experience. It was just like, but they would say, don't speak the language because they thought they'd get punished. That was the way they were raised in the boarding schools. You had a question. Hello, Jeff. I'm Diana Ullman. 
State Superintendent, 1991 to 94. Oh, State yeah, of Wyoming. We did interviews. <laughs> sure, good to see you. I'm really glad that you did this and trying to understand how to do justice and correct education for Native American children is very, very difficult. And since I was the state superintendent, I don't think it has become any better. No. It's very hard. Yeah. But we have much better reasons to think about doing it right and doing it well. And we have more and more support because of people like you who have managed to gain the trust of Native American leaders. And it's so important. It's so important what you said about meeting them one-on-one -on -one and coming to them on their terms instead of trying to drive everything from somewhere on high because it won't work. We should have learned our lesson by now. Well, you had one of the toughest jobs in Wyoming, and it still is. You know it that. Is. Um, very always in the crosshairs of somebody. Um, one of the things we do with this, and, and is being done more and more, is we create education modules out of the film. So we'll take Yay. particular topics out of it yes. and make a five-minute piece. We'll do a, a work study plan to go with it for teachers to use, so they can bring it into the classroom and tell elements of the story that fit into their own yeah. coursework. I don't know how much they get used. You know, they're available on national PBS, they're available on Wyoming PBS. We just finished them for this. So we'll see. Um, but anyway, great to see you. Thank you. Any other questions here? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. And uh, we had one of these schools in Revelstoke where I was taking uh, a First Nations people there. Uh, and as a kid growing up, I uh, boxed for a, 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 a rural a Catholic school. And they had some great schools in Vancouver, BC, Mission, and St. Mary's. And they were some really good athletes from there. I know this has got not too much to do with your story, but. I wondered if they had any like good part to make a good part of this thing. Did they have any sports in these schools that you were talking about? Were they yes, you know, hockey or whatever? Uh, well, so Carlisle had Jim Thorpe, that you know the most, yes. and, mm -hmm. and Pop Warner, believe it or not, was the coach, the football coach, I believe. That was football, football, right? Yeah. Track, yeah, football. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, he was the coach there for a while. Oddly enough, what brought what brought um, Carlisle down, if you will, in terms of federal sport and funding, was kind of a scandal in the in the sports department where money disappeared and stuff, and they couldn't account for it. And, but anyway, there were, in fact, that the the football team that Thorpe was on played. I'm trying to think, it was that might have been Harvard or something. They played some team that wouldn't today be recognized as a big football power, but then was, mm. and it was kind of a big deal, and they won. Mm -hmm. So they, they, had, they had that anyway. Uh, I, I mean, I think the, the people like Hugh Friday, who's in the film, people who went to boarding schools, often talk about that, about doing sports. And, and Betty said her dad, who wouldn't talk about the boarding school experience, came back and taught all the kids how to play baseball and coached them with it, and, you know, and that was all from the schools. So sports were a big thing. Yeah, these, two the schools, mm. these two schools, these two schools that yeah, so I was true. telling you about, um, St. Mary's and Mission, had a really good boxing program. Um, I never heard of any any problems there, but like I say, Revelstoke, BC, they found remains, they dug up remains and stuff there in Revelstoke, yeah. BC. First Nations people. Um, David Marin has just wrote a great book on Jim Thorpe. Uh, I knew that was coming, yeah. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm, yeah. And it talks all about Carlisle, all about his experience. He was there for many, many years. Right. Wow. And it's very interesting. 
I look for a lot of Carlisle stuff. Um, and I'm gonna we're we're gonna probably wrap this up here in a minute here, but uh, I wanted to ask one last question, and then I'd like you to talk a little bit about your next project. Um, but you know, uh, the legacy of the school has been the subject of much debate, controversy. But what do you think, after making this film and all of your research, what do you think is the most important lesson that we can learn from this history, and how can we apply it to the present day understanding of race, culture, education, and so on? Watch me dodge this question. <laughs> um, because because it isn't, you know, I, I am a little reticent about uh, drawing too many conclusions myself. Sure. We were just in Sarasota, and you all know probably, some of you know, the, the new college up there is a little bit under fire, I guess my, they would say anyway. And we had a bunch of those students come to the screening, and they immediately made some connections between this attempt to use education as a way, and again, well-meaning in some cases, of assimilating, but also of erasing an earlier culture, a culture that these kids might have brought with them but were not gonna be allowed to practice. Um, you know, they're, they're under the gun a little bit there, so in, in today's world, there are certainly things to think about how we use education and, and what the political influences on education should be. I'm going to say the same thing there that I would about Pratt, which is what's happening in Florida. I think there are some really well-meaning people involved in that. Uh, I won't agree with it, but that's not what you're here to hear about, what I think. It's just uh, these are things we can learn from. But what I end up saying ultimately is not here's the lessons and here's what we have to do. It's just get this into the curriculum, you know? I mean, it's like we'll, we've got really good material here, and kids get things they learn on the screen. So if you take a five minute piece that simply says, this is part of what we did coming out of the Indian Wars in this country, and here's the reasons we did it, mixed, and here's some of the results that we're still living with. That's huge. So I would say that's the thing I think ought to happen with, with documentaries like this, is the opportunity that we're getting from humanities councils and education departments, which are paying for these things, to create educational components out of stories like this yeah. could be really beneficial. Then kids can make their own judgments mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, the shorthand for that is teach the questions. There you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So put, well put. And your next project that you mentioned briefly, could you touch a little bit about that and let us know when we can expect it? And So we, we get, I mean, partly because this has done well, but we've had a couple of others that have done pretty well, and I think we're, we're getting we're making choices right now. We're, we've got one that just came out about missing and murdered indigenous women, which Jordan Dresser was the lead producer on. I just kind of stood in the background. Uh, that's doing festivals now, and I'm not sure when it will, or if, even if it will necessarily go to national. We've got a project um, with Pete Williams, who's an old NBC guy, you know Pete, I'm sure. And, uh, 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 Paul Petzl, who founded the National Electoral Leadership School, I didn't even mention this to you. That's a, just a, another of those climbing documentaries about sort of legends of the climbing world. But the big one right now is we're developing a project around the Federal Writers Project Guides of the 1930s. This was a New Deal project that, like all the WPA programs, were trying to put different sectors of the economy back to work. In this case, writers were put to work um, creating guidebooks to every state in the country and all the major cities. And they're wonderful guides. When I moved to Wyoming, I brought that guide with me and actually found a woman who ran the group that wrote it, uh, still living down in uh, Fort Collins. So did some writing about her and wrote a book eventually about traveling with the old guides. We're now developing a travel series that will take the old guides now almost 100 years later and re-travel the routes with different travelers going <coughs> further than they went, finding new things, hopefully a kind of PBS type travel series. We're going to start with Wyoming. That's our focus for the first you know, series that we do, but it's going to be sort of, I want to use the word franchise, but it'll be done all over the country with a national program as well. Great. Did I tell that? Is that what I was telling you about? No, 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 no. Yeah, but I'm <laughs> glad to hear it. No, that's, that's awesome, and, and we're looking forward to it. And if there's anybody else who has any last questions, feel free. Uh, otherwise, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up and say thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.